Hello, everyone. This is number 10 in my YouTube series that I'm just calling Bible Prophecy. I want to emphasize again, as I've done in just about every one of these segments, remember it's interpretations of Bible prophecy. And the Hebrew Bible primarily is where I'm starting. I'll end up with New Testament materials as well. But I have seen comments. I can't read all the comments. There are a lot on the first nine videos, but uh, people are saying, uh, I don't agree with your view of that or this or whatever. So none of this is really my view of what I would say about Daniel or what I would say about the book of Revelation or anything of that sort. I'm trying to take a historical view, an analytical view the way I would teach it in a university classroom. Now, there's not a seminary, not a church. And then people can take what I'm presenting and work out their own approaches and interpretations and so on. So just keep that in mind as time goes on, that uh, I don't want to debate views as much as present the possibilities. So eventually we will cover, as we've already have to some degree, all kinds of views, uh, none of which would be mine for sure, but views people have held and will deal with the idea as well of prophecy failing or when predictions don't come about the way people expect them to. So today in this 10th episode or segment, I want to ask a simple question. I think we can cover it just in this particular video. Does the Torah or the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, do they have a messianic apocalypticism to them? Do they have an eschatology? In other words, in the Torah, do you have something about the far, far future, and particularly messianic material, something about a Messiah coming or whatever? And the answer is uh, yes and no, depending on your point of view, I guess. So let me share my screen and get into what I want to talk about first here. So I'm going to start with my blog. There you see it. It's jamestabor.com. Very easy to find. It's got a great search feature here. And it's pretty accurate. I'm going to type in apocalyptic messianic. That'll give us what we need, I think. And I hit return. There we go. And I wanted you to see this particular entry. This blog has over, I think, 600 uh, blog posts. It would be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages if you printed it all out. And many of the entries are quite substantial, like this one. So notice this one's called Apocalyptic Messianic Eschatology. Now that's a mouthful, which it is. So if I click on that, I put this up in January 2018. You can see that I say quite a few things here about the historical background, some of which I'm covering in this series. But what I wanted to call your attention to was this list of passages. Let me reduce the screen just a little where you can see most all of them. Because you can go and copy this or print it out. And these are the essential passages that I will be covering as I cover the Hebrew Bible. If you remember, in the last two episodes, I said that there are only 10 prophecies in the Hebrew Bible that deal explicitly with a Davidic Messiah. That is, an anointed king of the tribe of Judah, of the lineage of King David. And we've already covered here some of them here. There's a few here. But today I want to go back up here and look at these three passages, one in Genesis, one in Numbers, and one in Deuteronomy. So let me stop that share. And I'm going to call up my slides. So here you can see the title, uh, The Mouthful, Apocalyptic Messianic Eschatology. And we did Daniel because it's so fundamental to this series. And we've also done the 10 Davidic passages. But now we're going to systematically go through and do all of them, basically. 
that by even the widest criteria could claim to be under this rubric. Now, eschatology is the end of the age. Some people call it the end of the world. Messianic talks about a final figure whom God anoints. Uh, as I've already presented in the Hebrew Bible, it's two, a king and a priest. The king is of the line of King David, the royal lineage of David. The priest is of the line of Aaron, uh, the brother of Moses. Apocalyptic means it's really near. Here's a really scary picture. Uh, if you know the artist Basil Wolverton, he's now passed away, but his son Monte, I believe, is still active. And they're both wonderful artists. And Basil Wolverton did a lot of illustrations for Mad Magazine. He also was involved with the artwork of the Worldwide Church of God and Herbert Armstrong back in the 60s, 70s, 80s. And some of these uh, apocalyptic pictures come from some of his work. This is a scene from the book of Revelation, where you have the heavenly signs and the heavens falling and earthquakes and all kinds of dire things happening. So let's go forward. Here you have uh, the Messianic apocalyptic eschatology chart that you saw in that blog post. Uh, I'm going to upload this to the description so that you'll have the link. And these are the ones we're going to do today. And you've got the whole rundown here of what we're covering. And take a look at that blog post if you'd like to, because I discuss some other preliminaries. So the first one is from the book of Genesis. It's Genesis 49. Verse 1 says, Jacob, the patriarch, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, 12 sons of Jacob, he called his sons together and he says, gather yourselves together that I may tell you what shall befall you in days to come. So as you can see, uh, the days to come in the art, this is the Revised Standard Version. It doesn't sound like the end of the age, but it's the Acharit Hayamin, what actually means the last days. So the last days gives more of a feeling of eschatology. But the phrase can mean later on, down the line, afterwards, or something like that. But I just chose the RSV here. I kind of like the latter days. That's certainly how Bible interpreters of prophecy have always taken it. So it would be for the end time, according to many interpreters. So in this chapter, Genesis 49, it's a poetic chapter. We think it might be more ancient than the final version of the book of Genesis. You have the patriarch Jacob, old and ready to die, blessing his sons one by one, and you would know them by the tribes of Israel. So Simeon and Levi and Naphtali and Gad and Asher and Dan and so forth. But Judah obviously is one of the major tribes. It's one of the largest. But King David comes from Judah. Of course, Jesus of Nazareth came from Judah according to our earliest source, which is the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, in the first few lines, he talks about Jesus descending from King David. So here's Judah. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey. My son, you have gone up like a lion. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as a lioness, who dares rouse him up? So maybe you've heard the phrase, the lion of the tribe of Judah. This is where it comes from. It's used in the New Testament and the book of Revelation. So let's go down to verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. So you picture a king with a scepter or with a staff and this is Hebrew parallelism. It's basically saying the scepter that is the ruler's staff. If it's not going to depart from Judah, that means that the rulers will come from Judah, which they did throughout history, all the way down to the last king of Judah in the time of Zedekiah and some of his sons during the Babylonian captivity in the 6th century BCE. But notice this. Until he comes to whom it belongs, 
and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. Now, that's very easy to take as messianic. Once you get past King Saul, the first king of Israel, in 1 Samuel, I think it's chapter 8, then all the kings, all the anointed rulers, all the messiahs, because the word messiah means anointed king, they come from Judah, they come from the line of David. So I could put this down as maybe a Davidic prophecy. It's not entirely clear because who is the one coming to whom it belongs? And to him will be the obedience of the peoples. Now there is a translation problem. This phrase that I've underlined, it's only three words in Hebrew, ki yavo shilo, and the King James translated as until Shiloh comes, maybe a figure like a proper noun, a name, somebody named Shiloh or who could be designated Shiloh. And Shiloh does seem to be associated with the notion of peace. Remember, there is a town of Shiloh north of Jerusalem in the time of the patriarchs in ancient Israel. So maybe it's Shiloh. Uh, in favor of that would be a mystical interpretation that I just want to point out to you because we're doing interpretations of these texts. I don't know if you know what gematria is, but in gematria, every letter of the Hebrew alphabet, there are 22 letters, they each have a numerical value. So you can take your name in Hebrew, put it into Hebrew. My name is James, the Hebrew is Yaakov or Jacob. And I can add up my number. Remember in the book of Revelation, the mark of the beast, it's a man's name and a number, right? And it works out, as we'll see later, to Neron Kasser, 666. So it's a way of identifying a prophetic figure. Well, it just so happens that the gematria for Shiloh, you can see, here's the letters, Shin, Yod, Lamech, He. If you look those up, and even if you don't know Hebrew, there's 300, you see what we're doing? And then you can go to the Yod, and there's the Yod is 10. Anyway, it comes out to 345. The word Moses, Mem, Shen, He, that also adds up to 345. And so you can see how mystical interpreters would say, well, Shiloh is the new Moses. And in the Dead Sea Scrolls, I've covered that a little bit in my episode on the first Messiah. They did believe that their prophet or teacher was the prophet like Moses. And in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, Stephen is preaching and he quotes Deuteronomy 15 that we're going to cover in a minute, one of our three here today, that talks about, I'm going to send a prophet like Moses. And Stephen says, Jesus is that prophet like Moses. Well, it's a big deal to be the prophet like Moses, as we're going to see. For one thing, you are the one who brought the covenant. And Jeremiah 31, 31 talks about a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, the northern and southern tribes in the future when all the tribes return to the land. And that's one of the things that the Messiah does. He inaugurates a new covenant once the tribes are back in the land. Now, it can also be translated. There's a variant reading. If you take the vowels out, you can play around with the different letters. But this is also a proposed reading. It might say something like literally, until what is his is brought to him. So you'll see some translations put that as tribute. I don't like that kind of translation. I'd rather just say literally, till what is his is brought to him. But anyway, that's the first one. I don't think it's quoted or alluded to in the New Testament. I'll have to check the Dead Sea Scrolls, but, uh, but I don't remember it being quoted. But you can see how people would apply it and say, well, Jesus, for example, he's of the tribe of Judah and he's of the lineage of David, and he's the one to whom the rule really belongs, and he's going to bring about the obedience of the peoples. Well, the obedience of the peoples is the Gentile world. So it does seem to have a scope that looks forward, okay? Next, 
So we call this the star and scepter prophecy. It's from the book of Numbers, chapter 24, verses 15 through 17. It is a prophet, but not a Jewish prophet. His name is Balaam. We actually have found references to him in archaeology. I'm not going to cover that today, but you can easily Google it. If you go to Biblical Archaeology Society uh, and open up their main site, you can search for Balaam, son of Beor, and he's actually mentioned in records of the time. Anyway, he is a Gentile or non-Jewish prophet, non-Israelite prophet, but he claims to get messages from the Most High God. The story is a long story. I'm not going to relate all the details here. But the king of Moab, Balak, gets hold of this prophet, Balaam, and tries to bribe him and pay him off. And he says, you're a pretty good prophet. Whenever you curse somebody or bless somebody, it seems to happen. So I want you to get up on the mountains of Nebo, and you can see the Israelites camp below. This is before they entered the promised land. And he says, I want you to curse these Israelite people. And Moses is still alive, and uh, Balaam tries it out. Uh, but what he does every time is he blesses them three different times. It's almost like, okay, I'm ready to curse them, and his mouth forms a blessing. Very interesting, because here, look at the language. He's giving an oracle. His eye is open, so he's a seer. Remember the word seer, S-E-E-R? He's looking forward like a seer into the future, and he gets an oracle. He hears the words of Elohim, God, and knows the knowledge of the Most High and the vision of the Almighty. Almighty is Shaddai. So we've got three ancient names of God. Not Yahweh used at this time, but God, Elohim, El Elyon, and Shaddai falling down but having his eyes uncovered so you get the idea that he puts his head down between his knees and then he sees things and then he tells what he sees so look what he sees i see him but not now so he can look down from the mountain and see the israelites camp below in the plains of moab but he says, it's not now. I see him, but this is a future vision. I behold him, but not near. So even though he's looking at Israel, this is a future. In the future, this is going to happen. A star shall come forth out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Now notice it doesn't say Davidic, doesn't say Judah. It just says a light is going to come like a star a shining figure of some type, and a scepter. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Shet. So I'm sure Balak didn't like hearing that, and that's explained in Numbers 24. You can read the whole chapter. This, by the way, gets picked up, you know, after the first Jewish revolt, 66 to 73 CE, and the Romans were able to celebrate a great triumph in Rome. And you've got the Ark of Titus that you can visit if you ever go with me to Rome. Or if you go on your own to Rome, you can visit it for that matter. You don't have to be with me. So many of you would be familiar with that. But what you might not be as familiar with is there was a second revolt. It was around 130, let's say 132 AD or CE. And it was led by another Messiah, not Jesus, he's gone, but a Messiah that called himself Son of the Star. Bar Kokhba was his messianic name. His given name, as it was written, is Bar Kosiba, but he gets called Bar Kokhba. So everybody says Bar Kokhba, Son of the Star, Bar is Son, Kokhba. So he claimed to basically be this one. And then a scepter would be his rulership. And he wanted to be declared King Messiah. Chances are he was of the tribe of Judah. I would certainly think he was probably of the line of David. And one of the great rabbis of the time, the greatest, who was a convert to Judaism, by the way, 
Rabbi Akiva did think and acknowledge that Bar Kosabar, Bar Kokhba was the Messiah. Now, it was a horrible war. A lot of times we say the Romans defeated the Jews in the Second Revolt, and they did, but it was almost a stalemate. If the Romans had not gotten help from some Spanish auxiliary forces, they might have been run out of the country. Now, Rome is eventually going to win with uh, two dozen legions, of course, but uh, it was tough for them to put down that revolt. And I think it's because of the messianic fervor. If somebody like Jesus of Nazareth had taken up arms, gathered thousands of followers, might have been a little harder for him to be put down because we think he was pretty popular in his own time. So we've got a dozen or more messiahs in the first century. Josephus, the Jewish historian, reports on them. And in each case, they gather a following. They try to declare a revolt against Rome, and the Romans come in and crucify them, behead them, or otherwise get rid of them. And none of these movements were successful. And that's what they did with Jesus of Nazareth as well. But the star and scepter prophecy is still out there. And notice he says it's not now and it's not near. So it's not in the time of Moses. It's not in the time setting of the book of Numbers. It's in the future. So you can see how this would be put down as a messianic prophecy. I didn't count it as one of my 10 because it doesn't specifically mention the lineage of David. And it does say will rise out of Israel in general. Okay. The third one, a prophet like Moses. I used to have a friend that called it a pro like Mo. Somebody should make a song using that. I think it's kind of cute. Who's the pro like Mo? I like it. Well, in Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 18, it's easy to remember the numbers. Uh, this is Yahweh or Jehovah. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brethren. Him shall you heed. Now, this is Moses speaking along the way in his final, final moments in life. Deuteronomy is his last discourse that he gives. And he says there's going to come another prophet. But notice the words like me because there are a lot of prophets, but a prophet like Moses has to fit this qualification, 3410, at the very end when Moses dies. And there has not arisen a prophet since in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. In one place, it says mouth to mouth, pale pay. In the other place, it says panim el panim, face to face. In other words, Moses taught directly to God or Jehovah, uh, to Yahweh. He went up the mountain. He even saw the form of God. He would go into the tent of meeting, which is not the tabernacle, but a tent that he pitched outside the camp, and he would have conversations with God. So this intimacy with God is looked forward to here. And uh, he recounts the fact that uh, the people wanted a mediator. They didn't want to talk directly to God because they were so scared. This is talking about Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. But notice again, it's repeated. Verse 18, I will raise up for them a prophet like you. So that's what God told him. Moses, I'm going to raise up for the people a prophet like you. I will put my words in his mouth and he will speak all that I command him. So let me stop the share and let's put this together for you. So here you see in the Torah, three very interesting passages. And uh, let me start with that last one and work back because we just covered it. Some have argued in various rabbinic sources and other people have said, well, the prophet like Moses is Joshua because he's the successor of Moses. But, you know, if you read the book of Joshua, it says that Joshua, if he wanted to inquire of the Lord, he had to go to the priest and consult what is called the Urim and the Thummim, some sort of a divination 
Uh, we think they might be even stones or something that are rolled in. Uh, it's an ancient way of doing divination and you probably would just get a yes or no answer. Uh, but the yes and no is kind of the idea. Should I go into battle? You go to the priest, he tells you. So Joshua is never described in this unbelievably extravagant way, you know, a prophet like Moses. People claim to talk to God today. The Lord told me this, the Lord told me that. The word Lord is very confusing because it applies to Jesus and God to many people. But this seems really different. When you get the description of Moses, he sees the timunah, the form of God, like a picture of God. It's even used in Hebrew today. A timunah is the, an image. And uh, he sees the backside of God's glory at one point in the book of Exodus. But he's not allowed to gaze into God's face. So God comes in a cloud, but he can see him. And he goes in a tent and speaks face to face as a man speaks with his friend. So I'm on Zoom now and I'm talking to you face to face. Can't see you, but the idea is the intimacy, the directness of it. Now, you can see how that would be interpreted as a final Moses. And if there's a final Moses, would he not be the inaugurator of a new covenant? But would that be the Davidic figure? Can he also be the prophet like Moses? So what happens with the Christians is they combine everything. There's Jesus is the king because he's of the line of David, but he's also the prophet like Moses. And he's also a priest after the order of Melchizedek as it's, I think, mistranslated in Psalm 110. If you didn't hear that, go back to the previous video and I talk about that. Uh, I don't think it's talking about Melchizedek from the book of Genesis, but it's using a term uh, you are my priest according to my word, O king of righteousness. So it's more that idea, Melchizedek. So that you can see is just waiting out there for someone to claim to be the great and final revelator, almost the other side of the evil figure. Remember the evil figure in the book of Daniel? He claims to speak as if he's God and claims he is God. Well, he would be the flip side, antichrist then, of the Christ figure, at least according to Christian interpretation. Now, in some texts that we will cover, you can have both figures or even all three. You can have a middle figure who's the prophet and then a priest and a king. So we're going to go over all of that. This series is going to go for a while. And people are mentioning other passages and bringing up things that I've already covered. But if I haven't covered it, I'm going to cover it. And I'll tell you what I'll do at the end. I'll give you a way to contact me with some final questions. And I'll try to cover all the loose ends. It's going to take a while, but I want to cover all those passages that I showed on the screen. You can go to my blog post and check them out yourself. So this is number 10. We're going to move on. I don't know how many there will be. We'll just keep going until we're done, I guess. So take care, everybody, and I'll see you next time.